Welcome everybody for our February meeting, AHSA Queensland. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Warwick Henry, the president of the Queensland branch. As usual, we've got our Peter Dunn is doing all the good mechanical and electronic work, running the GPS, running the GPS, right. running the <laughs> Zoom and all that electronic stuff. Uh, we've got a few guests here tonight, in particular our speaker, David Smith, of whom you'll be hearing a lot in a little while and his wife, Sharon. Uh, also, Bruno Gay from France, from Paris Air Service, and visiting us for in Australia for a few weeks. <laughs> um, we've also got uh, Krista Crutchley and Steve Crutchley, and Steve and Peter. Thank you. Um, nice to have you with us. Anyway, I might as well give over to our speaker. And uh, thanks very much, David. Over to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been threatened with a fate worse than death if I let this drag on for more than 45 minutes, so I'm going to get right into it. I joined the Royal Navy back in 1973 as a generalist seaman officer and um, subspecialized into the fleet hour arm about five years later. And for reasons which I've never fully understood, I got selected to fly the Sea Harriers. And back in those days, that essentially meant uh, going to be Royal Air Force with the fast jet uh, training scheme, uh, which took about three and a half years. And um, in March 1982, I completed that training and was appointed to my first frontline squadron, which was 800 Naval Air Squadron based on board HMS Hermes. Uh, I did my first uh, two weeks on board, embarked, where I did my first uh, deck landings and getting used to the shipboard routine and things like that. And then at the end of a month, uh, we disembarked to our Naval Air Station at Yeovilton in Somerset and began two weeks of Easter leave. Well, unbeknownst to us, especially the junior pilots, things were starting to hot up in the South Atlantic. I'm so sorry. Yep. <clears throat> And this was a secret signal sent to the then governor of the Falklands, Sir Rex Hunt. And I'll read, it's from uh, Lord Carrington, who is the then foreign secretary. We have now apparently reliable evidence that an Argentine task force will gather off Cape Pembroke early tomorrow morning, the 2nd of April. And this is a bit I love. You and Buenos Aires will wish to make your dispositions accordingly. I, I think that's diplomatic speak for saying, you're on your own, chum. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, the then uh, Prime Minister of the UK, Margaret Thatcher, thought differently. And um, after a weekend of frantic activity, we were all recalled from leave. Uh, we flew eight of our sea harriers from Yeovilton down to uh, HMS Hermes, which was alongside in Portsmouth Harbour. And uh, that Monday morning, we sailed for the South Atlantic. We briefly joined up with the um, task force as we deployed south, stopped for a short while in Ascension Island, uh, which is about halfway between the UK and the Falklands. And then we arrived uh, off the Falklands on the 30th of April, 1982, and commenced operations uh, the next day. So uh, to begin with, um, there wasn't a great deal of air activity for the first uh, three weeks uh, of the Falklands. The Argentinians sent uh, quite a lot of high-level probes across uh, with their Mirage 3s, uh, with the intention of trying to get us to get up to their level to uh, fight air combat. We weren't going to go up there, and they weren't going to come down below 15,000 feet, which is where we wanted to um, to do our air combat. So basically, not a great deal happened. But what we did do is we spent a lot of time um, on Alert 5, which I'll get onto in a second. Uh, first of all, a little bit about the Sea Harrier. Um, this is the airplane I was flying. Sea Harrier FRS-1 stands for Fighter Strike uh, Reconnaissance. Uh, it was a single-seat VSTOL fighter based on the Royal Air Force GR-3. Um, the modifications were it had a raised cockpit and a bubble canopy to enhance the visibility 
uh, in maritime operations. And the fuselage had been extended to accommodate the Blue Fox radar. Uh, the airplane also had some modifications to marine resistant alloys um, and coatings just to cope with the marine um, environment. It was quite quick at low level. We could do about 650 knots. Uh, we had a total fuel load of 6,600 uh, 6, uh, 6, pounds of fuel. And uh, potentially we could carry uh, weapons on five stations, two wing stations and one between the uh, cannons on the belly of the aircraft. Uh, we were mainly configured in the air defense situation. So we had uh, two of these Sidewinder A9 Lima uh, heat seeking missiles. And uh, on the belly of the aircraft, we had twin Aden 30 millimeter cannons with 120 rounds per cannon. And it's basically a single barrel um, revolver mechanism. And when that spun up to speed, it had a rate of fire of about 1,700 rounds per minute. So, yeah, as I mentioned, we spent uh, most of the first uh, three weeks uh, spending a great deal of time on what we used to call Alert 5. And that was strapped into the flight deck, uh, just uh, strapped into the cockpit on the flight deck and just waiting for a launch. And sometimes you'd spend up to two, two and a half hours um, waiting uh, on Alert 5, and then you'd be either scrambled or sent off on a, uh, a mission of some sorts or other. Uh, you'd come back, the airplane would be refueled, and if necessary, rearmed. And you'd get about 10 minutes to get out of a cockpit to go and stretch your legs, back into the cockpit again for another two hours on Alert. So we spent a great deal of time sitting in the cockpit waiting for things to happen. Uh, and uh, a typical day when the weather was good, you'd fly maybe three, sometimes four missions, and you'd spend about six hours in the cockpit on alert. Of course, that all changed on the 21st of May. We began our landings at a place called San Carlos Water, uh, which is uh, in the Falkland Sound, which is a strip of water between the west and east uh, Falkland Islands. And thereafter, the Argentinians stepped up their raids uh, big time. And we became very, very busy um, on combat air patrol after that. This is a pretty famous picture. This is um, an Argentinian dagger aircraft on its attack run in the um, San Carlos water. <clears throat> uh, they mainly use these aircraft, which is the Israeli built version of the French Mirage 5. <clears throat> and we also saw quite a few um, A4 Skyhawks from both the Argentinian Navy and the Argentinian Air Force. So this is the setup. Um, essentially, we had the three combat air patrol stations. One was up there uh, designated by the red dots. One was up to the north, one at the middle of the sound, and one down to the south. And um, <clears throat> our job was to try to intercept the raids, which are uh, more or less shown by the red arrows uh, coming in from the west before they got into the blue box, which is actually around the, uh, the San Carlos water. The blue box uh, represents what we used to call the AEA, um, which is the air exclusion area. And the reason it was called that is because it was a free fire zone. Um, all the warships were there, which were armed with uh, surface to air missiles, uh, 40 and 20 millimeter uh, anti aircraft weaponry. And all the spare sailors and crewmen were positioned on deck with general purpose machine guns. And they were told to shoot at anything that moved. And they were not taught the difference between an A4 Skyhawk and a Harrier. Mm -hmm. So if we strayed in there, we had a good chance of getting our tail shot off by our own side. So once, uh, if we couldn't intercept the raid in time, we had to fall off before we got to that um, blue box. Now, the big problem for us was the fact that both aircraft carriers were stationed about 230 nautical miles off to the east of the Falklands. And the reason they were doing that was to keep out of range of the Argentinian fighter bombers. So for us, it meant about a 20 minute transit to get to the combat air patrol station. Uh, and at best you had maybe 20 minutes, possibly 25 minutes on task. And then you had to do the 25, 20 minute um, transit back. Um, so it was a big problem logistically. Uh, you had two aircraft on, on combat air patrol. You'd have two aircraft going back to the carrier, two aircraft coming back into the um, combat zone. To relieve you. So on each of those three combat air patrol zones, you uh, actually have six aircraft um, transiting either to and from or actually on task. 18 Harriers. Um, I think we only had um, 22 at maximum during, during the war. 
so uh, just going to go forward a couple of days now to my first um, action on the 24th of May, 1982. I was wingman to my boss. My boss was a guy called Lieutenant Commander Andrew Old. Uh, we'd been sitting on Alert 5 for approximately an hour and a half, if memory serves. And then we heard over the um, flight deck tannoy, scramble red section. Um, so that's where you had to throw away all the stuff you were playing with at the time. You had to slam the canopy closed. Uh, you had to arm the ejection seat, which means taking the pin out of the um, the main handle between your legs, put it up on a little rack on the canopy. You had to arm the miniature detonating cord. Pin went up there as well. And you'd show two fingers to your crewman to show that you'd done that, and he would acknowledge. Uh, then he'd give you a startup signal. And this all had to happen within about three minutes, so it was quite, quite fast. Uh, you'd fast start the engine, uh, you'd uh, align the uh, navigational system, you'd make sure that all your weapon systems came online. Uh, whilst you're doing that, the ship was picking up speed, you could feel the deck vibrating as she accelerated up onto the, the flying course, and then the deck would be tilting uh, quite aggressively as she turned onto the flying course into wind. <clears throat> uh, once the deck had stabilised, um, they'd unchain you from your parking position, and you'd be handed over to a marshaler. Uh, the marshal would take you onto the center line and he'd marshal you forward to um, the launch spot. The launch spot was uh, determined by your all up weight, your fuel, and your weapons, uh, the individual aircraft engine performance, and most importantly, the wind over the deck. So he'd marshal you forward. Um, once you got to the spot, um, they'd break you. You'd be handed over to the flight deck officer who would control your actual launch. Uh, we would then do what we call the fast checks, F-A-S-T. Uh, F was for flaps, you had to make sure the flaps were fully down. Uh, A was for axle, you had to do what was called a bottom end axle. Uh, so you took the throttle from the idle position, which was 27%, uh, smashed it up to the midpoint, 55, and you had to time that. And from memory, it was about two, two and a quarter seconds it had to be. You then took your hand off the throttle onto the nozzle lever. The nozzle went down to 20 degrees. And what you're checking there is that a bleed valve in the engine opened and fed high pressure air out to the wings and the nose and the tail to the reaction controls. And this is basically what gave you the ability to control the airplane in the hover. And you saw a little gauge on the instrument panel flick to show that you got that. And it was essential that you got that, otherwise you wouldn't be controlling the airplane when you came back into the hover on completion of your mission. Uh, nozzles back to 10, which was the standard position for the takeoff. Uh, S was the stop. You'd actually set a stop between the throttle and the nozzle lever at 35 degrees, and that would be the position you'd pull the nozzles down to when you exited the ski ramp. And the final, the T was for trim. You used to trim the aircraft to make sure that when you left the ski ramp, you didn't have to touch the controls. It was more or less a hands-off takeoff. Uh, then you'd look up to Flyco. Flyco is like the control tower on an aircraft carrier. There was a system of um, uh, traffic lights up there. When you saw that you had a green, it meant that the window of the deck was correct. Uh, the ship was steadied on the flying course and the area ahead was clear. Uh, next to that was a box that had the ship's heading. It's really essential that you had to input the ship's heading into your navigational computer. And then you'd look down at the flight deck officer. He'd give you the wind up and put his flag down to the deck. You'd look straight ahead. And uh, what you had to judge then was the ship would be pitching because it's usually pretty rough in the, the South Atlantic. And you had to judge it so that uh, when you hit the ramp, the bows were doing this. <laughs> because if you did it when you did that, you're in for a pretty interesting takeoff. So look ahead, time that, um, final check of the flight deck officer, make sure that everything was good, slam full power. And the Harrier had the most eye-watering acceleration. 2,000, sorry, 20,500 pounds of thrust would arrive in the small of your back in about one and a quarter seconds. And you'd roar down the center line. Uh, you hit the ramp. As you exited the ramp, you take your hand off the throttle. Now, this is essential onto the nozzle lever. I have seen somebody leave their hand on the throttle lever and pull that back when they exited the ramp, which uh, made for a very interesting launch. Uh, the nozzles came down to 35 degrees. It was more or less a hands off takeoff. You just had to monitor the angle of attack, side slip, quick look at the temperatures and pressures to make sure the engine was behaving. And then once the airplane reached what we call the top of the apogee, You'd feed the nozzles forward, the airplane would accelerate very fast. You had to be pretty quick to get the gear up. The limiting speed was 250 knots. And then you bring the flaps from full up to mid. 
and that had to be done before you exceeded 300 knots again, which happened in a matter of seconds. Um, I think on this occasion, the boss launched behind me, so I pulled out to the left, um, waited for him to stabilize, and then off we went. And we used to do the transit um, above 25,000 feet because we used to transit directly over Stanley Airfield where the Argentinians were based, and they were absolutely bristling with quite capable uh, anti-aircraft weaponry. They had um, AAA, which could exceed 20,000 feet, and they had a very capable French uh, missile system called the Roland, which again could exceed about um, 20,000 feet. So we used to transit um, above 25, usually around about 30,000 feet to get to the combat air patrol zone. Uh, during the transit, we take turns to roll in behind each other, um, check out your radar, check out the missile, check out the gun sight. Um, used to set the gun sight manually to an aircraft you thought you might encounter. Now, for some reason, I seem to remember the Mirage wingspan was 27 feet. And you'd set that so that if you ended up in a gun's position, you use the throttle twist grip to adjust the ring on the gun sight over the wingspan. And that would give the predicted gun sight the information uh, to give you the correct lead to fire at the, um, the target. So out we went, 30,000 feet. Uh, on that particular occasion, <clears throat> we were going to be designated to take up the northerly cap station. And on the 24th of May, um, the HMS Coventry uh, was going to be our control ship. And she was basically looking for inbound raids coming in from the west. And um, she had what we call the goalkeeper, which was HMS Broadsword, which was basically there to protect her. And the Broadsword had a fairly new uh, close-in weapon system called the Seawall system, uh, which they thought would be capable of taking out the low-level threat. So on the way down to the combat air patrol zone in the long descent, we were chatting to the, the direction officer. We used to call him the Freddy. Uh, Freddy was telling us that all was quiet. Uh, they were actually, by the time we got onto the uh, combat air patrol station, it was air raid warning yellow, which is basically all quiet on the Western front. Uh, combat air patrol, you know, it's a bit like being in a holding pattern. We used to fly from what we called the defensive combat spread. Uh, you're about a mile and a half on the beam of, um, you, you, I was a mile and a half on the beam of my boss, usually with a bit of a height split. And the, the idea behind this is that you can look both, both of you can look deep into each other's six o'clock so you can negate any threat that might turn into you. And at the same time, you can do a radar and visual search ahead to see what's happening out, up threat. Uh, well, that didn't last for long. Um, we'd been there for approximately two or three minutes when we got air raid warning red. And um, HMS Coventry had seen an inbound road coming in along the north of the islands there. And uh, we got this over the radio. Uh, raid inbound from the west. Numbers are unknown, and they believe going low level because they were starting to lose radar contact. And then they designated us, uh, red section. And the call was red section, buster, buster. Head 260, which was the initial attack heading. Buster, buster. Buster means you just go to full power. Um, and bring your speed up as fast as you can. I flew back into what we call the fighting wing, which is about 150 meters on the boss's um, uh, starboard echelon. And my responsibility now is to maneuver with him and keep an eye on what's going on behind us. And whilst he does all the, the number crunching to uh, carry out the intercept. So what we did, um, the, uh, the Freddy would not give you any direction. He wouldn't tell you where to go. He wouldn't give you left, right, up, down, or anything like that he would simply give you a range and bearing of the inbound target. And we were trained uh, to crunch the numbers to basically establish yourself on a reciprocal track to the inbound raid uh, with about a five nautical mile displacement. And then using the cues from a Freddy uh, as a raid came in, uh, you'd start your turn in at a certain angle off, I forget the actual numbers now, and eventually lead turn. And if you got this absolutely right, you would end up behind the target um, three quarters of a mile, uh, which is the absolute sweet spot for the Sidewinder missile at low level. So the boss was doing all the, the crunching of the numbers. I was just hanging on for dear life, trying to look behind to make sure there's nobody behind us. And that's what it looked like. We were up to about 540 knots at that stage. We were down below 200 feet. We began the turn in for the attack. It was about a 6G turn, G suits of giving your legs a good squeeze and your tummy a squeeze as you come around the, the corner. And the boss, he got it absolutely dead right. 
the rolled out behind these three guys, um, three daggers coming in at 520 knots at about 150 feet. Um, we found out later that it was uh, called Oro section, which is a Spanish for gold. And the boss um, immediately converted onto the left-hand element, fired his missile. I saw the missile trail. Um, it hit the, the left-hand guy, a huge fireball, um, absolutely no reaction from the, um, the formation of mirages at all. He then converted onto the right-hand guy, the same deal, missile went straight up this guy's jet pipe, big fireball, uh, no reaction. And by this time, the leader had obviously envied what was happening, and uh, the boss had fired both his missiles then, so he said something on the radio like, that one's yours. And so I turned in behind the, the leader. The leader, I saw him clear his wing. I saw all his um, external fuel tanks and bombs floating away into the, into the sky. Uh, he lit his afterburner, which was very convenient because I got a very good heat signature off that on my <laughs> missile. Um, and then I was, I was pulling as hard as I could. The, the Mirage was uh, probably pulling six or seven G. And I had my, in the head-up display, I had my missile cross, which is a, a St. Andrew's cross like that. And I was pulling as hard as I could to try and pull it over his heat source. And as it went over the heat source, um, you get a growl from the, um, from the missile seeker head. It just growls at you in your headset. Uh, so I then clicked the accept button. The cross turned into a little diamond. And you hear a chirping in your, your headset and you see that the diamond is actually tracking the target. Um, I was overbanking at the time to try and hold this guy in my sights. Uh, the range looked about right, so I rolled open the catch and I pressed the button. <laughs> there was a, a sizable bang and the missile went off a rail. Initially, it did a couple of swirly things whilst it was trying to sort of, I guess, sort itself out. Um, and then much to my surprise, being a brand new pilot, I'd never fired a missile before. It took a huge bite of lead and disappeared off in this direction, which I thought was a bit strange. Um, anyway, so I thought maybe the missile had uh, malfunctioned, so I was trying to get round for a second shot. But actually, the missile was doing exactly what it was designed to do. It was designed to pull lead on the target, and the missile went straight across the, the middle of the turn and just uh, kind of looked like it just knocked a couple of flakes of paint off this guy's tail, which was very disappointing because I'd just seen the boss explode these two airplanes from stern shots. And um, I thought maybe the warhead had not exploded or something like that. So I was positioning myself for another, another shot. And curiously, the guy stopped turning altogether. He rolled wings level and he started what looked like to me a completely controlled descent down towards the high ground uh, at a place called Pebble Island, which is just to the north of the, the western Falkland Island. And I was kind of flummoxed by this because I couldn't figure out what he was doing. Um, and then there was a kind of thin vapor trail just coming out from the back of his aeroplane. And the next thing that happened was it turned into this colossal fireball. I mean, he was quite literally towing a fireball which was about 100 meters long. Um, it was the most extraordinary sight, and um, he still wasn't ejecting, and I, I, I couldn't sort of figure out why he wasn't doing this, because his aeroplane was clearly not going anywhere, and he was getting lower and lower and lower, and I was kind of sort of willing him to eject, I remember this, you know, and um, but nothing was happening, and it, it seemed like his aeroplane was under control. And then just before ground impact, literally just before, I saw the what we call the ejection seat bullet pull the parachute out from his cockpit. And I saw the parachute as a candle, not deployed. And then at that very minute, a fourth Mirage flew directly underneath me, um, which at the time we thought was in the same formation, but it turned out to be somebody else. So I flick rolled and tried to pull around to get this guy, but he was doing, I don't know, 700 knots or something like that. So by the time I got into a position to sh shoot, he was well out of range. And out of a corner of my eye, I saw this guy uh, hit the ground in a huge fireball, and I never saw a deployed parachute. Uh, so that was that. That was the um, the end of the first um, action. Um, I'm going to fast forward now, um, due to the time constraints and all that, um, to the 8th of June, uh, which was my second action. Uh, but I need to give you a bit of background about night flying to the aircraft carrier, because this uh, pertains uh, particularly to this action. We didn't actually end up doing much night flying in the Falklands, but the uh, command considered it to be a real threat. Uh, because of the possibility of shadowing aircraft and actually pinpointing where the aircraft carriers were. So it, what it meant was that some of our more experienced pilots had to be on alert 
um, overnight. So you'd have sometimes three, sometimes four pilots either strapped into the airplane all night or at a very high state of alert in the crew ready room. And uh, what that meant was that these guys had to rest up a bit during the day. So that very much diluted the experience of the day combat teams. I mean, people like me and my mate who just joined the squadron were actually leading combat sorties, which is a bit crazy. So the command solution was to qualify more like night flyers. Now, how do you qualify night flyers in the middle of a conflict in the South Atlantic in a single seat fighter, fighter, uh, fighter aircraft? Uh, and the answer is you do a series of what we call duskers. Um, so you launch uh, around about sunset, you fly off, you do your mission, and you come back during the, the first sortie is during the, the first sort of um, light duskish period. Uh, you fly the complete night profile, which I'm going to get onto in a minute, uh, and then you land on, and you can see the horizon, you can see the lights of the ship, uh, you can actually see the sea surface, so it's no real big deal. Uh, the next night you go out a bit later, and you come back when it's a bit darker, um, and then over a period of about four or five days, you transition into a completely black approach. Uh, people often ask me, what's the big deal about flying a black approach to the aircraft carrier? But, but believe me, um, in a Harrier, which you're basically flying a piano uh, perched on top of a, a hot jet thrust column, um, once you're doing the transition from conventional flight to jet thrust um, on a really black night with no horizon, it can be very, very challenging. And you really, really do end your your flying pay. Um, so that was the idea. That was the, the concept. Now, um, quickly about the difference between the day approach and the night approach, because this is significant. Uh, this is a day approach, okay? So you'd normally uh, end up uh, loitering behind the ship uh, if you had the time and you had the fuel. And you'd adjust your fuel load to what we used to call the hover weight. Now, this is something you'd calculate on board the carrier before you got airborne. And that was an amount of fuel the airplane could carry and uh, the engine could uh, achieve sufficient thrust to maintain a hover. And then once you got that, and uh, if you were given what was called a Charlie time, which is a land on time, you'd aim to be a beam the ship uh, two minutes and 15 seconds prior to that. And you break downwind, uh, at the beginning of a downwind leg, uh, flaps down, gear down. And then once you got to the end of a downwind leg, which was a beam the back of the, the ship, uh, nozzles came down to 20 degrees. Again, you check that duct pressure. You'd now be flying totally on angle of attack. I couldn't even begin to tell you what airspeed I was flying at this point because you used to peg uh, the angle of attack in the head-up display at eight units as you came around the corner. Halfway around the corner, 40 degrees of nozzle. And every time you took more nozzle, you had to put more power up to compensate for the loss of uh, wing lift. Uh, roll out on finals, uh, nozzles back into the hover stop, power coming up to almost uh, 100%. And then you come up alongside the ship and you'd aim to hover um, alongside the ship 40 feet above the deck. Uh, stabilize, transition across to the center line, down, bang, slam the throttle closed, nozzle lever forward, taxi away from the, the hot spot. Now, the thing about this was that if you flew it well, you'd probably only use maybe 200 pounds of fuel, um, maybe even less if you were in the hover for just a few seconds. Uh, the night approach was completely different. The night approach, we used to stabilize, uh, marshal the airplane about uh, four and a half, five miles behind the aircraft carrier. And you'd uh, configure the airplane, full flap, gear down, and the nozzle set at 60 degrees. And the reason you did that was to stabilize the airplane at about 130 knots. Uh, but the power was right up there. You had about 90% power um, in order to stabilize the airplane on this. And then the final controller would pick you up, um, and he would start your uh, three-degree slope descent from about uh, three miles behind the ship. And uh, for those of you who remember the old PAR system, it was a bit like that. He would uh, give you, he'd tell you your high, your low, your left, your right, and how to correct. And he would take you down to 0.8 of a mile. And at 0.8 of a mile from touchdown, he would say, 0.8 of a mile, look up for sight. And what you do is you look up for the, the landing site, which was basically a row of green datum lights, lights with a, a white ball in the middle. And this is stabilized to the three degree uh, glide path. So it didn't matter what the carrier was doing, uh, this was a stabilized three degree slope. Uh, so you'd then fly that into uh, the hover, the D cell on the hover. Behind the, um, the site was a guy called the LSO, the landing site officer, and he was looking through like a sort of head up display, and he could see the three degree slope on this. And uh, that was called the Roger, and he'd refer you to the Roger. So you're on the Roger, you're going a little high, adjust, you're going low, um, adjust. 
And then the, the big warnings were no lower, which meant watch out, you're getting low. And then if you got the, the panic call, which was power, uh, that meant you had, to, had to, you had to slam through the limiters and try and rescue the situation. And that meant that you were getting dangerously low. And then you'd fly the approach in all the way into the, um, alongside the carrier again, stabilize, come across and land. But the important thing about this was that it would use upwards of 600 pounds of fuel, maybe six, sometimes 800 pounds of fuel to do this compared to the day approach, which was probably less than 200 pounds. So here we go. Um, myself and a fellow called Dave Morgan, who was um, a flight lieutenant in the Royal Air Force who'd been seconded to us. He was an experienced um, ground attack uh, Harrier pilot, but like me, had very little experience of carrier operations. We were chosen to be the first two stooges for this uh, Duskers training. And on the 8th of June, uh, June we launched for our first Duskers um, sortie. Uh, we were designated to fly over to a place called Bluff Cove, uh, which is where the HMS Sir Galahad and the HMS Sir Tristram were unloading the Welsh Guards who were preparing to um, uh, mount the final attack on Stanley. Uh, we had no uh, radar support on this uh, combat air patrol. It was a purely visual um, cap, and we were sitting up at 10,000 feet. Um, earlier in the day, the HMS Galahad had been attacked by Argentinian fighter bombers and she'd been hit really badly. And um, this was an incredible sight to see from 10,000 feet. Uh, the light was failing, clouds and clouds of this oily black smoke coming up um, into the sky. Um, the fires were burning so fiercely at the back of the ship that you could quite literally see the back of the ship glowing red. And it was just a horrific sight, it really was. And you could see all the helicopters down there mounting the rescue effort and all the life for us were deployed around the ship, you know, to try and ferry the, you know, these poor guys ashore, you know, to the, the field hospitals. Um, so we sat overhead that we could only give it um, at best 15, 20 minutes because we had to get back to the ship to conduct this um, fuel heavy approach. And uh, it was about four minutes, I think, three or four minutes before we were due to go back. David was, we were just in a combat turn at the very end, about the last turn of the combat air patrol. David was back here. We were turning at slow speed. When he gets on the radio, and <laughs> he yells, four mirages, follow me down. And then he just kept on saying on the radio, follow me, follow me, which was great, you know, because I couldn't see him at this point. He, he just vanished, you know. <clears throat> and um, he rolled inverted from 10,000 feet and just went for the surface. And that's the last I saw of him for a while. So I did the same rolled upside down, pointed my aeroplane at the, the surface. Uh, from 10,000 feet, the aeroplane accelerates incredibly quickly. Uh, I mean, really, really fast. Um, I pulled out over the sea at something like 150 feet, going as fast as I've ever been in a Harrier. <laughs> I've been a bit like this. For some reason, it sticks in my mind. I, I was looking down at some instrument down here. There was a button which you have to press to make sure it's on, which gives power to the, the missile. And I needed to make sure that was on before I got into combat. And next to that is the, the standby airspeed indicator. And I knew if the needle was at the top, I was doing 600 knots, and the needle was over here somewhere. So I know my speed was approximately 630 knots, and I was about 100 feet over the sea. And I couldn't see anything. Um, David was out there somewhere, and I have absolutely no idea where at this stage. The approximate disposition was something like this. Dave Morgan was out here to the left at low level. I was about a mile behind him back here. And he was chasing these uh, three A4 Skyhawks, it turned out. And they weren't Mirages after all. And there was a fourth Skyhawk around, but we never knew where he was. So um, I'm trying to figure out where the fight is. I saw a missile trail, and I saw the left-hand guy get hit and explode in a large fireball. And then very similar to the um, action on the 24th of May, Dave Morgan then pulled onto the right-hand guy and fired similar results. Um, but now he'd really got the bit between his teeth and he was closing up on the third guy and he fired both his missiles because he could have a go at him with his cannons. I mean, he was really furious if you read his book. Um, and um, he opened up the uh, safety catch for the trigger and he pulled the trigger for the cannons. And as he did that, um, he had an electrical fault and his gun sight disappeared. <clears throat> so uh, he thought he'd fire anyway, so he just held the trigger down and he emptied his cannons, 120 rounds per, per gun, at this guy, it didn't actually hit him, but, but what it showed me was I could look ahead now and I could see on the water uh, his fuller shot. 
going like this in two sort of columns. And in between it, I could see the A4, and he was doing what we call a, a gun's jink like this. Um, and I kind of extrapolated backwards, and it's getting pretty dark by now, so it's getting hard to see. And then I could see Dave, and so I could see Dave, and I could see um, the target. So the next thing that happened was uh, Dave pulled up because he'd run out of ammunition and he was probably getting pretty low on fuel by then. And uh, I could see the target. I got a good growl. I locked the target and I got a good missile lock. And I remember looking at it and thinking, ah, oh, you know, that's that's more than three quarters of a mile. <laughs> you know, but is it worth taking the shot anyway? And I was kind of thinking about this. And look, this is all happening very quickly, but time seems to slow down in these situations. And uh, I'm just about to fire when uh, a guy called Sharky Ward, who is the boss of the other squadron on HMS Invincible, he's on a, a combat air patrol down to the south of us with his wingman, a guy called Steve Thomas. And he comes up on the radio and he says, OK, uh, red section, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take over the combat from here. Thank, oh. thank you, thank you, thank you, you see. And <clears throat> I had this awful moment of doubt. I, I, I thought, has he flown in front of me? You know, because I couldn't really positively identify this A4. Um, you know, it, it kind of looks similar uh, from the back to a Harrier, you know, and uh, I thought, has he or his wingman somehow got in front of me? And I had to do this sort of, this logic, you know, here I am at 630 knots at 120 feet, you know, and, yeah. you know, and I, I got a missile lock on this guy and I'm, I'm trying to think, what do I do? Um, and I thought, no, it's got to be a hostile. I've just seen Dave fire at him. So I, I said, yeah, <laughs> and I pressed the button. Um, there was this enormous bang. I mean, nobody had fired a, a missile in test flying uh, off a Harrier at this speed before. Um, and the missile leapt off a rail and it, it almost put me on my back, the action and reaction of a missile going off a rail, uh, which caught my attention a little bit. <laughs> and uh, anyway, flicked the airplane back upright and all was well. But as soon as the missile left the rail, Sharky came on the radio again and said, who fired that shot? <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, I fired at his wingman. And um, it, it seemed to be like an eternity. And Steve Thomas, you know, very laconically came up and said, wasn't me, boss. And so I knew that I hadn't fired at him. And then I watched the missile track the target. And I must have fired out of range because uh, a few hundred meters before it got there, I saw it flame out. But um, I think I had so much excess speed on the, the A4, which might have been doing maybe 480, 500 knots. But the missile had the energy and it hit him um, and a split second later he just smashed into the ground um, just like that yeah so and that was the end of him i'm afraid yeah. was that a uh, no we were just just going over a bit of ground at that time yeah. so i pulled back um went up and joined up with dave morgan we were up at thirty thousand feet we were both seriously short of fuel at the stage and okay. uh, we managed to get the attention of hms hermes that this is our problem and they turned the ship around and started steaming towards us at high speed to try and narrow the gap a bit. Um, I realized that if I did the full profile with my nozzles at 60, uh, power up at 90%, I didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of actually making it. So I, I chose to modify the approach um, and fly down using 20 degrees of nozzle. Um, the drawback of that was that I'd be flying at the bottom of the um, descent at around about 220, 230 knots, which is going to make a fairly hairy decel to the deck. But I figured that was the only way I was going to manage it. In the Harrier, we had low fuel lights up on the top of the combing on the right there. And if my memory is correct, um, these used to come on steady when you had uh, 600 pounds of internal fuel left on each side. And if you bear in mind, the airplane burns about 200 pounds a minute in the hover. So you've got um, about six minutes in and they start flashing at you. Uh, when you've got um, 300 pounds a side left, so about uh, three minutes of fuel left. And bearing in mind that you couldn't actually use all that fuel, some of it was unusable. So uh, there we are. Um, I'm coming down. I've come off the bottom of the slope. I'm coming in really fast. The landing side officer is telling me that I'm coming in much, much too fast and I need to do something about it. But I wasn't going to touch my nozzles until I got pretty close to the deck. And my plan was to take the nozzles straight into what we call the braking stop, which is where the, the nozzles point about 15 degrees forward of a hover stop. And it gives you a very significant braking, actually. Um, and I did that, slammed to full power. Um, the airplane shuddered to a halt. You know, your, your shoulder straps really cut into you because it, it decelerates so quickly. I could see the ship surging up, and I was just kind of hoping I'd got this right. 
and much more by good luck and good judgment. I shuddered to a halt alongside. These lights are flashing at me. Um, I was absolutely in panic stations by now because I was convinced the engine was going to stop. Um, transitioned across, pulled the power back, came down, landed. <laughs> there was nobody more relieved than me. Um, slammed the throttle closed, uh, nozzles forward. They taxied me forward off a hot spot, shot me down immediately, chained me to the deck, the ship turned around and head her off back to her station. Uh, so that was that. They dipped my tanks afterwards. They reckon I had 45 seconds of fuel left. So that was that. I'm going to move right on now. Um, I left the Navy a few years later, joined Cathay Pacific. This is a, a subscript, which is sort of quite amusing in a way. Uh, I was the captain of a Airbus 340-300 flying from Hong Kong direct into Paris. And um, I was awake in the middle of the night, as we usually were, because of the time difference, browsing the internet. And for some reason, on that particular night, I was looking at things Argentinian. And I stumbled across this website. Um, it's called Modeling Madness. And um, there's this fellow called Pablo Calcaterra, um, who is an Argentinian fellow who lives in Toronto in Canada. And he used to build these beautiful models and um, uh, photograph them and publish them on the internet. And he used to like to build, uh, to photograph a, a model which had a, a bit of a story to it. So this was um, flown by a fellow called um, Capitan Raul Diaz uh, during the Falklands. He, he would, for example, um, build a model of Douglas Bader's Spitfire or uh, the Dan Buster's Lancaster or something like that. And he used to write the story uh, to these particular aircraft. And uh, this is the one that caught my attention. Part of the, um, the storyline said the massive blast of air made uh, Capitan Diaz believe that he had crashed the plane into water or land, uh, but he realized he had ejected successfully when he saw his knees towards the sky and his parachute open. And I read on and um, I realized to my absolute astonishment that this is a guy I'd shot down on the 24th of May. Uh, I, I was just gobsmacked. I was, it was like a sort of epiphany, it really was. Um, I was actually quite pleased, you know, that he got away with it. And um, so I immediately got on to this guy, Pablo. I said, Pablo, hello, my name is David Smith. I was a lieutenant in the Royal Navy uh, back in uh, 1982. I think I shot this bloke down and um, I didn't think he got out in time, you know, so what's the story? Now, Pablo is one of these wonderful uh, aviation enthusiasts, you know, hello, oh, David, you know, welcome to my world, you know, and all this. And it turns out that he had uh, uh, contacts in the Argentinian Air Force and he was able to give me now Colonel Raul Diaz's email address. So I sent him an email and said, um, hello, sir. You know, my name is David Smith. I believe I'm a guy who shot you down. Um, you know, I'm glad to hear you made it. You know, could you, could you please tell me what the story was? And he was incredibly gentlemanly about it. He sent me this marvelous email, which was, I think it was written in Catalan Spanish and probably Google translated. So I had to make quite a few adjustments to it, but I've, I've paraphrased a few of the, um, uh, the things he said. Dear David, it has been a pleasant surprise to receive your email. Uh, Oro, which was the gold section, took off from San Julian to attack your beachhead in San Carlos Canal. I was the leader. Uh, Lieutenant Carlos Castillo was number two and Major Louis Puga was number three. Uh, Castillo flew to my left and Puga to my right. As we neared the objective, we adopted a closer formation in order to concentrate our bombs on the target. Uh, we flew uh, very low and at high speed to avoid interception, but we lacked radar warning receivers to know if we were being illuminated by the Marine or Harrier radars. And for this reason, we didn't know about your presence until we began to be hit <laughs> by the AIM-9 Lemurs. It continues. Uh, the first indication was Puga. So Puga was a right-hand guy, okay? So he's looking across the formation like this. Puga shouting that number three has been hit by a missile. He probably said that in a few octaves above his normal voice. So uh, I didn't recognize the voice of Puga. So he repeated, Oro three has been hit by a missile. Uh, but actually he was number three. Uh, so in the stress of a moment, he'd mixed up the call signs. But what that made Raul Diaz do is that he looked towards Puga, you see. And as he did that, uh, he saw another missile approaching him, which would impact him before he could react. I screamed at him to eject, but it was too late, and I saw his aircraft explode in flames, reaching right up to the cockpit. Uh, I ejected the tanks of fuel and bombs, and I made a hard turn to the right at maximum G. In the middle of a turn, I was hit by your missile. 
and far from being under control, my mirage began to vibrate terribly. And these were the actual words of his uh, message I had to include. The floor mermaid sounded and the lights of serious floors lit all. <laughs> I was left without control and smoke began to enter the cockpit. I attempted to eject using the upper rings, but I couldn't reach them. And I had to use the lower one between the legs. When the ejection began, I believed I had hit the water because the wind blast was unbearable. Single memory, two instances of the ejection, when I saw my knees towards the sky and when the parachute opened up. Uh, during the ejection, I had dislocation of a right elbow and fractures of a 4A and 5A lumbar vertebra. David, I thank you for the gracefulness of indicating to me that it was for you gratifying to know that I had survived the ejection. I consider it a gentleman's act. Mm. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my story. So um, I'd be happy to take that. was terrific, David. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions <laughs> of people busting to ask. Who's going to be first? Uh, is the mermaid the bitching Betty that we, we think of? You know, the female voice over the uh, intercom, do you think, saying, we're on fire, get out? Okay. <laughs> Most likely, yeah, yeah. We didn't have one in the Harrier. Um, but I, I shouldn't be surprised if he had something in the um, in the in the mirage that said something like that. Yeah, yeah. You, your airplane is kaput. You know, time to leave. Chum. Yeah, yeah. That may have been a misinterpretation of the word siren, translated as mermaid. <laughs> yeah, sirens more likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Any other questions from out in Zoomland? There's no Zoomland. Okay, local people. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. How many hours do you think you flew in the whole uh, yeah, uh, the sort is some of them are quite short, um, some of them about um, an hour, just under an hour, or just over an hour. Um, I think I flew in a region of 55, 54, 55 missions, I think, in total. Yeah, uh, the whole um conflict was very short, it's only six weeks, you know, began on the first of May, finished on the 14th of June, and the, the main activity was um, really after the 21st of June, you know, when the, the landings happened. So, so yeah. Not a great deal, you know, all the fighter sorties are quite short, you know, so um, I didn't accumulate a huge number of hours at all. Yes, Bob. How many others uh, got kills in addition to you, the two that um, you did and the other fellows too? The, uh, the Sea Harriers in total on both ships uh, shot down 20 Argentinian aircraft. I think we shot down 12, I think the other ship got um, 10. And in total, the Argentinian air losses, um, including all the uh, ground to air fire, um, aircraft losses on the ground was uh, in the region of 54 aircraft, I think they lost in total. And how many Harriers did you lose? Sea Harriers? Did you... uh, we didn't lose any to air to air. Um, we um, lost um, a guy called Nick Taylor uh, when he was doing a ground attack on uh, Goose Green. Uh, early on in the conflict, he was shot down by AAA. And one of our guys was um, lost on a night launch. He, he took off and um, we're not quite sure what happened, but um, he possibly mishandled the airplane on a night launch. He was an experienced Phantom pilot, but very inexperienced on the Harrier. So we think he may have crashed um, on takeoff with a, a mishandling the airplane. Um, HMS Invincible lost two Sea Harriers and what we think was a probable mid-air collision. Um, so four guys were killed um, and uh, one guy was shot down over <clears throat> Stanley Airport when he was trying to look for trade and he got picked off by a Roland missile, but he survived. Um, I think that was about it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I gather that the, with the Sea Harrier, you didn't have the option of doing a rolling landing. It was always a vertical landing, was it? Um, the brakes didn't work very well on the Harrier. So, so no. <laughs> and we didn't have a hook. Yeah. Um, you could, um, if you had a, a major problem with the nozzles, you could do what was called a rolling vertical landing. So you could actually roll forward at about, say, 20 or 30 knots and hope that your brakes work, stop mm. in time. But no, um, all the recoveries were um, vertical landings, yeah. Yep. Yes. David, one of the things that struck me was your description of how busy you were as a pilot, but also when you were coming into your night landing with a low amount of fuel, your recalculation. So it amazes me the amount of, um, awareness you had of what was going on and even though you said it was lucky um, I think that there was more than luck I think your skill emphasis and your training emphasized how good you were 
Yeah, well, we we sort of had a, a pretty good idea of what the fuel flow rates were um, in various different regimes. Um, you know, we knew, for example, um, if you're flying up at high level, it's using about 50 pounds a minute. In the hover, it's 200 pounds a minute. Um, if you're flying at uh, low level at, say, 500 knots, it was about 100 pounds a minute from, from memory. So you had a, a bit of an idea of, of where your fuel was going. Uh, and you knew that if you were going to fly the full night approach, you were going to use a lot of fuel, you know, so you had to modify it to come in, or I had to modify it you know, in order to, to get in without flaming out. What was the maximum Mach number <laughs> you could use in a sea hurry? <laughs> wasn't a supersonic airplane. Yeah. However, yeah, um, there was a way of making it go supersonic, and that was a way of frightening the captain. Um, <clears throat> you used to climb up to about 40,000 feet, and you then go into a vertical dive, and if you started pulling out around about 20,000 feet, and if you popped the air brake, the air brake in the Harrier came out from underneath, it would just excite a supersonic boom. <laughs> and so the captain would be on the bridge with his cup of tea, and he'd get this... <laughs> And so he'd turn around to Commander Air and say, what was that, wings? And uh, Commander would say, so it wouldn't be one of ours, sir, they're not the supersonic. And I'd say, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you'd have been arriving at the same time as the sound if you were also going at the speed of sound. Well, yeah, that would slow down very quickly. It, it was, the problem was the big cheek intakes. You know, you just couldn't go fast on the speed of sound in the Harrier, really. Yeah. Had the power to do it, but uh, yeah. Yes, Ewan. <laughs> yes, Ewan, go ahead. Thanks. Given the high tip, uh, tempo of operations, is that on? Yes, yeah. Given the high uh, tempo of operations, what was the overall uh, availability of the aircraft, the operational um, it, availability? It was, uh, extraordinarily good. It really, really was. Um, mechanically, engine-wise, power plant-wise, um, we, we had absolutely uh, zero problems. It was quite extraordinary. The big problem we had was that the... Um, uh, the hangars were very crowded with all, all the uh, helicopter traffic and the various Harriers. You know, we had both the Air Force Harriers and our uh, Sea Harriers on board. So we had to park a lot of airplanes on deck. And of course, in the South Atlantic weather, that meant a lot of salt spray. And so you'd often get airborne and find that um, your electronics weren't working. Um, you know, the radar wouldn't be working. Your head-up display wouldn't be working. The uh, radar warning receiver wouldn't work. Your navigation computer would go down. But interestingly enough, um, as you got airborne for the high-level uh, transit uh, between the aircraft carrier and the combat air patrol zone, things started to dry out, and dink, the radar would come back on, the missile would come back on, head-up display would come on. So, but overall, the, the serviceability was absolutely phenomenal, I and mean, it really, really was. The, the, the Harrier was uh, an incredibly robust airplane, and um, it actually dealt with the conditions very well. Yeah. yeah. You had INS? Uh, sort of, yeah. Um, it was um, a thing called a Doppler updated um, INS. Um, so basically, it used, a, uh, used the Doppler radar to update itself. Um, the uh, inertial navigation system itself was very crude, and it was deliberately made that way so that it could align on deck when the deck's doing this. Um, so the, the really crucial thing uh, was to uh, give the final ship's heading just before you launch to the, the system, because that kind of told it where it was. The, the Air Force Harriers, the GR3s which were on board, had tremendous problems because they're used to lining up their very accurate uh, total INS system on a, on a ground-based okay. station. And so they had to introduce this box of tricks which um, kind of pretended that the deck was still and they, they, they still found that they had terrible problems with their weapon aiming systems and all that sort of stuff. But um, no, the Sea Harrier was good. Um, the, the system wasn't that accurate. Um, but that didn't really matter because the ship always lied about where it would be when you came back anyway. Nope, nope, nothing like that. No, no. It would make itself vulnerable. Um, usually in the, the morning brief, and they would say, right, we'll launch you here and we'll recover you there. So you'd go there, and of course the ship wouldn't be there. You see, yeah. the ship had changed its mind and gone somewhere else, you know. So um, yeah. it didn't, it didn't really help if your navigation system no. was accurate or not. Yeah, so. So you always used to carry a little bit of fuel for mum if um, for those sort of situations, yeah. David, question. 30 millimeter. Yeah. How long would the burst go before it ran out? <laughs> Cup, how many seconds? Okay, well, we had 120 rounds. Um, the weapon spun up to about 1,700 rounds per minute, so you had about six seconds about, yeah. Six. Yeah. But, um, but the way that we usually fired it was um, just in short bursts, you know, so you just go brrr and 10 rounds would go off, you know, and then brr, when Dave fired at um, this guy at low level, he just held the trigger down and just fired 120 rounds in, in the general direction, yeah. Okay. yeah. Would that have been a similar 30 millimeter cannon that we had in the Mirages? 
Oh uh, yeah, it's the same. I think it's the same weapon. I think Aiden, Aiden Cannon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the saber too. Peter, I've got a question. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, David, John Meyer. I'm a uh, retired RAAF navigator. Um, I've got a question about your uh, strike missions. We've most of us have read the books about the RAF uh, GR3 is doing their business. Did you guys do many um, strike missions, or were you dedicated to purely air to air? Um, <clears throat> before the GR3s arrived, um, we conducted quite a few of the strike missions. In fact, we carried out the first raid on Stanley Airfield on the 1st of May. Uh, John Hanrahan, who was the embedded um, BBC reporter at the time, famously said, I counted them all out and I counted them all back. Yeah, so we sent uh, nine Harriers against um, Stanley Airfield and three went up to Goose Green. So before the GR3s uh, got established, um, we were conducting the, the strikes. Um, and we used to carry out, um, we had a reasonably good uh, toss bombing um, uh, system on the airplane. So we carried out um, toss bomb attacks where you'd fly in at high speed and from about um, six or seven miles back, you'd start a toss maneuver and you'd release three 1,000 pound bombs to fly over and um, hit your target. Uh, but once the GR3s arrived, um, these guys are the experts in ground attack. So they took over the role and we were uh, then re-rolled mainly to the air defense role. And that's what we spent the rest of the conflict doing. With the toss bombing, toss bombing I should say, was that very inaccurate or fairly accurate after all? It wasn't bombing? actually too bad. Um, <clears throat> towards the very end of the conflict, we started getting the laser guided um, bombs as well. So you'd end up um, tossing the bombs. I mean, it was an extraordinary system. It was completely automatic. You'd you'd lock the target using the, the navigation system. Um, it would tell you when to pull up. You'd pull up to about 4G, um, to about a sort of 45 degree angle of bank. Uh, when the system reckoned it was right, it would release bombs. You'd have a bomb go bang, bang, bang as they came off. And then you'd start your escape maneuver. So you'd roll inverted and start pulling away. As you did that, you'd be in close formation with three 1,000 pound bombs. You know, it was, it was a bit, bit alarming. Um, that when we had the laser guidance, um, you'd have a, an SAS guy sitting in the hill somewhere with a laser pointer uh, pointing at the target. And um, the idea would be to drop the, the bombs into what was called the, the umbrella, and they then fly down and, and hit the target. Yeah, it was uh, quite effective and accurate. Yeah. So those bombs had some guidance system at the end, did Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they had little wings, so they had it on the nose, it had like a sort of set of um, uh, winglets. Yeah. And they would guide it down to the target. Yeah. So the ground liaison officer would send coordinates. No, 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 just no. no. He he would just designate the target with his laser oh, laser okay. pointer, if you like. Yeah. And then the the, the bomb uh, had a, a seeker head, which would pick up the um the signal laser reflections, and then uh, fly itself down the beam, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just refresh us. You know, it happened in 1982, of course. How long was it uh, from the beginning of the the Argy's landing until they gave up? Uh, they surrendered on the 14th of June. Um, we departed uh, Portsmouth on the 5th of April uh, and they uh, invaded the islands on the 2nd of April. So 2nd of April to the 14th of June was how long they were on the islands for. Yeah. yeah. So originally it was on the way even before the Argy's had landed? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. The Argentinians landed on the 2nd of April. And the fleet uh, left on the 4th. And, and we left on the 5th of April. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Phenomenally yeah. fast. Yeah, very fast. I suppose in that it, it, it was, yes. The operation well, no, especially as we were on leave. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. It was quite funny. We were. Uh, I was living um, in a cottage with three other guys at the time, and um, I think it was on the evening of the the first of April. We'd all been down to the pub as as you do, and um, the telephone went at something like one o'clock in the morning. And this guy said, um, "We need you all to get down to the air station now." And the guy who picked up the phone said, yeah, April Fool, good one. Put the uh, phone down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you would. yeah. And, and of course, the phone rang about real. 20 minutes later, by which time somebody much more senior and somebody who was very angry said, get down to the airfield now. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ewan. Given that you had um, rapier batteries, which appear to be outside your free fire zone, was there any possibility of conflict or did you rely totally on IFF? <laughs> it's a good question. It was very scary. Yeah. Um, it, we relied on IFF and, and you had to and it changed every half hour, I think it was, you know, so you had to make sure you change the codes, you know, uh, accordingly. But yeah, we um, uh, quite soon after we landed, um, we established a landing strip um, at San Carlos, which is just a metal strip across a field, basically. 
And the idea was that we'd um, uh, then fly the combat air patrols uh, mission. You could then go and land at San Carlos, refuel, rearm, and then continue the, the sortie. Uh, but the, the whole strip was surrounded by these rapier batteries. <laughs> and it, was, it was absolutely terrifying. You, you come in and you decel on the downwind leg and these rapier batteries would be tracking you like this. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and you think, I hope I got my IFF right, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no, we relied on IFF. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the metal. Was that the same sort of pierced steel plating they had in World War II? Yep, yep, PSP, yeah. yep. Just about indestructible, that stuff. It was incredible, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a, a runway built of it, and we had a taxiway, which was um, three strips about this wide, one for the nose wheel and the main wheel, and um, two strips of the two little trainer wheels on the side. And it used to taxi off around this between two great big sort of sand dunes and sort of sit there hunkered down whilst all these raids were coming across. It was, it was quite scary. You'd have the mirages flying across at zero feet and the A4s, and you were just convinced that they were targeting you, you know, in your little sea harrier. Um, and you used to sit there waiting for the scramble um, call again, and then off you go. And um, they had this strip, I think it was only about um, 500 meters long or something like that. And you used to go to full power. And there was a couple of barrels at the end of the, um, the strip. And that was where you just took the nozzles and up you went and took off. It was, it was pretty Heath Robinson, but it, but it worked. Yeah, yeah. Could you take off with the nozzles fully forward, you know, bring the thrust back uh, with no degree out or just uh, straight? If, if you really uh, had to, yes. If yeah. you really it, had it, to. It'd be your, your rotate speed would be about 190 knots. And and you could you could land conventionally as well. But, but um, yeah, the touchdown speed was about 185 knots uh, if you landed conventionally, yeah. It hardened the tires. So, so the, the actual standard landing on a on a on um, an asphalt runway would be 65 degrees of nozzle and um, airplane would land at about 130 knots doing that. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, no, whether the Harrier, Sea Harrier, had no, no, no steering. It, it did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you had a little button on the stick, um, which you pressed, which gave you a direct noseable steering, which you used on the aircraft carrier. Um, but that was directly linked to the anti-skid system. And you had to make sure that the anti-skid switch, uh, switch was off for carrier operations. Obviously, if you needed to brake in a hurry, it didn't matter if the tires blew. But when you came back to your um, land station, it was essential that you remember to put the anti-skid switch back on. And um, oft times you'd hear squadrons disembarking from the aircraft carrier, but the airplane would land on immediately followed by the uh, airfield siren. Air, uh, Harrier on the main runway, main tires burst. You know, so mm. it's, it's, it's very easy to forget. Well, it looks like that's the yeah. winding up time. It's been a very interesting talk indeed. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very, very much for coming and telling us the story. Yep, my pleasure. Good. <laughs>